Dear audience, dear friends, good morning. Good morning to everybody, good morning to all participants in the United States and good afternoon for the ones in Europe. My name is Ville, Ville Skinnari, Finland's Minister for Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade. Welcome to Climate Week, New York, side event, food for thought. Climate Week is the most active climate-related event on the planet, organized simultaneously with the UN General Assembly and powered by the city of New York. As the event week organizers have said, the main target of Climate Week is to get stuff done, to implement not just plan and have the seminar. And therefore, in, in this event, we focus on food waste and practical ways of reducing it to reach the sustainable development goals set by the uh, United Nations. Finland has a strong commitment to the sustainable development goals. Actually, Finland is currently ranked as number one, number one of all member states in the overall performance and our capital Helsinki was the second city in the world after New York to commit to the voluntary local reviews. And of course I'm proud that my home city Lahti was the European green capital and paves the way for carbon neutrality by 2025. We want Finland to be a carbon neutral country by 2035. To achieve this target, we have created 14 industry specific roadmaps to guide the way, including one for the food industry. And the key here is, it's not the public sector only, it's a private sector, mutual commitment, paving the way at the very local level and therefore the cities uh, play key role. In the context of um, food systems, Finland is full of family-owned farms and production facilities and the grocery retailer operations are well managed. Our people value nature and as co consumers they have very high standards for sustainability. On a governance level we want to make the industry operations transparent and standardize information so that businesses as well as consumers can make well-educated decisions by themselves. Still, we all have an equal responsibility to help our planet by finding solutions to save natural resources while also feeding people in areas suffering from hunger. Today we have gathered an excellent team of panelists, experts from the fields of research and businesses to discuss the best practices and the new ways to reduce food waste across the supply chains. Before we give the stage to our panelists, we will hear a short keynote introduction to the topic. Once again, thank you for being here with us. Thank you on my behalf and I hope you will gain some new perspectives during the discussions and most importantly find ways to implement all the know-how, best practices, what we have together. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much, Minister Skinari. Uh, and welcome everyone to Food for Thought. We have a very insightful program for you today and we are leading it off with our keynote speaker, Ben Gray, who is co-founder and the Chief Innovation Officer of the Upcycled Food Association, a trade association whose mission it is to reduce food waste by growing the upcycled food economy. Um, ben, uh, please. 
Good morning to everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Business Finland and the Government of Finland for the opportunity to take part in this discussion. Um, I'm quite honored to be uh, to be asked to give this keynote and to be um, a colleague on the, the stage with the other panelists. Uh, we're together during a time when uh, countries, of course, are convening in the UN, and many of us here are focused on climate, something that's begun to affect each and every community in the world. Uh, but before we review that daunting challenge, uh, let's start with the unseen, the unwanted, and the untapped. So when we talk about food and food waste, those are the three key areas that we at the Upcycled Food Association, where I'm a co-founder and chief innovation officer, focus on the unseen. Think about cacao fruit or the fruit outside of the coffee bean, something that we all may have interacted with this morning, where normally only the beans or that central portion is used. There is an example for cacao fruit, 70% of that pod that doesn't get used in normal chocolate production. The unwanted, ugly produce, fruits and vegetables, that maybe don't meet spec, aren't the right size or color, um, but of course have been used for centuries, possibly even longer for things like jams and jellies. Or the untapped, the rise of oat milk and other plant-based milks. We have all that pulp, pulp from juicing and otherwise that can be turned into uh, flour or spent grain from brewing. So at the Upcycled Food Association, we represent over 220 companies that where others see barriers, these companies are seeing opportunities. But of course, food loss and waste is an, an almost unfathomable challenge. If global food waste were a country, it would represent the third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions behind the US and China. That represents 30% of fresh water, 30% of arable land globally, and 8% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. That's about 1 billion food, uh, tons of food annually, which has been calculated to a $1 trillion problem in wasted resources. According to Project Drawdown, which is a list of the 100 most impactful solutions to preventing climate change, more than solar panels, more than electric cars, more than wind tur turbines. Reducing food waste is the number one most impactful thing our global community can do to fight climate change. And from where I sit here in the US, ReFed estimates that uh, the part that represents surplus represents about $250 billion in lost revenue. So the Upcycled Food Association, which I'll speak to here in a second, aims to help build a partnership between consumers and industry so that we can put all those resources, financial, human, and otherwise, included in that valuation, we can put them to their best use. Upcycled Food Association began with 10 founding members in October of 2019. And we're a member-driven nonprofit trade association with the mission of reducing food waste by growing the upcycled food economy. We support members, there are over 220 of them, by increasing investment in and demand for upcycled products, improving the upcycled product supply chain, growing the network of companies in the space, and with our signature consumer-facing initiative, which is the Upcycled Certified Program, the world's first third-party certification program that shows consumers that the ingredients and the products that they are purchasing includes food that would otherwise have gone to waste. In 2019, the Upcycled Food Association partnered with the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic, ReFed, World Wildlife Fund, Drexel Food Lab, and the Natural Resources Defense Council of whom we have sharing the stage with us today, to define upcycled food for industry, academia, government, and the consumer. And the definition that that group came up with was upcycled foods use ingredients that otherwise would not have gone to human consumption, are procured and produced using verifiable supply chains, and have a positive impact on the environment. 
We use that definition as the basis to create a certification program for ingredients and products that contain upcycled food that we call the Upcycled Certified Program. So let's break that down. What does it mean to have an upcycled product? Well, upcycled products are value added. As we said earlier, it's the unseen, the unwanted, the untapped, and transforming those ingredients into uh, materials that can be used in consumer products. Upcycled foods have an auditable supply chain, meaning that you can show these ingredients were going to waste, and now they are going into products for consumers. And by using those unseen, unwanted, and untapped resources, we hope to foster that environmental impact that is the end of the, the definition that was uh, produced. So we're already seeing really wonderful adoption. In 2019, before the UFA uh, was founded, Future Market Insights uh, measured the upcycled food industry at $46.1 billion with a compound annual growth rate of 5%. The upcycled certified program has been available in the, for ingredients and products that are sold in the US uh, since last June and in Canada since last April. And from, those, uh, from that time period, there have been 46 upcycled uh, uh, companies that have certified ingredients and products. That represents somewhere around three, uh, 220 ingredients and products and close to 1 billion pounds of food that have been diverted as a result of these ingredients and products. This is a number that we expected at Upcycled Food Association to see within 10 years of existing. And uh, after almost uh, one and a half years of the certification program being live, we have hit that billion pound target and hope to get to even more in the very near future. So again, Upcycled Certified is the world's first certification that tells consumers they're preventing food waste every time they've purchased an upcycled product. The scope includes not only food and beverage, but also cosmetics, supplements, home care, cleaning products, and uh, including those food and beverages. Some of the high level requirements include showing documentation that inputs were previously destined for a food waste destination and are now going into a consumer product, showing bills of lading, proof of segregation, food safety, similar to other certifications. And compliance with the upcycled certification is looked at by a third party verified certification body, which is one of the most trusted in the industry, also working with the USD organic program and the non-GMO project. And we know that this concept is resonating with consumers. Upcycled certified uh, has seen growth of sales with products with the mark on pack of over a thousand percent in the last year. We also know that 62% of consumers are willing to pay more for a product that fights food waste. And after educated, 70% of consumers have a greater intention to buy the upcycled product when it's compared to a conventional product. As we know, we have seen this as a trend. Uh, Whole Foods has, has called it the next big thing. Food Network has uh, gotten on board as well as the Chef's Best Award in 2022. But we do not see this as a trend, uh, as something that is going to be gone in six months. We see this as a way to partner with consumers to change the food system so that industry and consumers can come together to build a resilient food system and ultimately to fight climate change. So please feel free to reach out after this presentation. My email address is here. Um, again, a huge thanks to Business Finland for the opportunity and uh, really excited to continue the conversation. Great. Th thank you, Ben. Great to learn about Upcycled Foods' impactful mission. We will now be moving on to the panel discussion, uh, and I will be moderating. My name is Bart Ketlarik. I'm a senior advisor for Business Finland, 
and I had been in the food and beverage industry for seven years of prior experience. So this topic is very close and dear to me. Um, so if we could already start with a round of introductions, I'll go through each of the panelists. So of course we have Ben, Ben Gray, Chief Innovation Officer of Upcycled Food Association. We have Svante Gutta, Head of Sustainability for Relix. We have Dr. Yuka Latamaki, Professor at NYU. And we have Inkari Ripa and Mia Quisma, Research Scientists at the Natural Resources Institute for Finland, Luke. And also Madeleine Keating, City Strategist, National Resources Defense Council. So could we kindly do a round of introductions uh, briefly? Uh, Madeline, would you like to start? Yeah, I'm happy to, and thanks so much for having me today. Um, my name is Madeline Keating, as you mentioned. I'm a city strategist with the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. We are an environmental nonprofit based in the United States with offices um, in also Beijing and India. So we do international work on a wide variety of climate-related issues, including food waste, of course. Um, my work focuses in on city solutions for food waste and pre prevention food surplus food rescue and redistribution and food scrap recycling and so i work really closely with cities and community-based organizations as well as on policy work and i'm based in the u.s thank you ma'am uh svanta would you like to go yeah sure hi everybody and hello from gothenburg sweden so I'm uh, Svante Jette. I'm head of sustainability at Relic Solutions. And uh, what is Relic Solutions, you might think? Um, we're a Finnish software company, or Finnish founded, but, but nowadays with a global reach. And uh, we provide software for supply chain optimization. So we work with hundreds of retailers, um, wholesalers, and, and consumer goods manufacturing companies around the globe. And um, in fact, very large proportion of our customer base is grocery grocery companies. So we are very very well positioned to to fight fight the food waste together with our our customers all over the world. Nice to be here. Thank you, Svante. Uh, Dr. Yuka, would you like to go? Yes. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. So I'm Dr. Yuka Lightemaki, and um, came to America in 1984. Did my doctorate at Cornell. School of Hotel Administration, and I've been last 20 years at NYU at the Jonathan M. Tisch Center of Hospitality, where we are focusing on global experiential and entrepreneurial topics and, of course, sustainability. My work has been um, uh, related to the food waste in terms of restaurant business, in terms of the supply chain, and looking at the PL, profit loss statements, and looking at the food cost and seeing the opportunities front of the house and back of the house and how how restaurants could improve their profitability by by attacking the food waste thanks for having me thank you uh mia would you like to introduce yourself yes thank you hello everybody my name is mia kuisma i'm working as a research scientist in the natural resource institute finland i'm located in mikkeli here in finland and in Luca, we have worked um, uh, over uh, a decade with uh, food waste issues, and now we are building um, a system how to collect and report the national uh, food waste uh, information. And um, I'm working with this with my colleague Ingeri, uh, who might uh, say some more words about the, the work. Thank you. Inkeri. Yeah, thank you and hello everyone and thanks for invitation to this uh, webinar. Yes, my name is Inkeri Riipi and uh, I'm working with uh, uh, this Natural Resources Institute Finland also and um, I've been working with uh, uh, different kind of sustainability issues in the food chain in a uh, uh, couple of years and, and now uh, especially concerning these uh, food waste issues. And yeah, we have been built up this uh, uh, food waste monitoring system in Finland um, um, in the last uh, three years and also we have uh, built up uh, our national uh, uh, food waste roadmap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. So uh, we'll then proceed to the questions. So the first question I'd like to direct at Madeline and Inkeri. So is there always a standard amount of waste in the food system? And how much is the food loss per capita in Finland, the USA? What are the drivers of this and what have been the recent developments? Inkeri or Madeline, yeah, would you like? Okay. Okay, I can start. Yeah, uh, well, um, we have a data especially uh, concerning edible food waste. So uh, we have done research um, uh, since 2009 and, and first 10 years we have been collecting data uh, concerning this edible food waste. And uh, But uh, uh, since we have been using uh, different kind of methods and the representative or sample size that uh, difference in uh, years, so it's not so easy to compare uh, between the years. But uh, but anyhow, uh, for example, regarding um, retail and food service sector, uh, we can say that uh, it has been decreased the amount of uh, this edible food waste. But uh, uh, now, uh, since European Co Commission said this kind of delegated act, which uh, obligates all the mem member states to collect, um, and report food waste uh, data. So we have been also collecting this uh, inedible part. And based on our studies, uh, uh, the amount of food waste, so including also this inedible part, is uh, 160 kilos per capita per year. And this uh, edible part is uh, 65 kilos per capita per year in Finland. Th thank yeah, you. For that. And yes, Madeline, do you want to address the United States? Yeah, so in the United States, um, I mean, as Ben mentioned in his keynote, about a third of the world's food goes uneaten. And in the US, um, that number is up to 40% of food going uneaten. So it's a significant amount and it happens across the entire food supply chain here. Um, there's a great organization called ReFed, which NRDC works with cl very closely, that has a roadmap to reduce food waste, breaking down the different sectors and how much food is coming from each sector. There's about 21% of food loss coming from the farms before that food even leaves the farm and gets into um, into processing. A significant amount comes from manufacturing, about 13%, and then another 13% from the retail sector. About 16% is coming from food service, like restaurants and inst institutions. But the biggest place where we're seeing significant amount of food waste is actually from homes. And so when we create interventions, we're tr really trying to target how can we support consumers in eating all of the food that they purchase, being intentional about their purchases and making their dollar go further. Um, we did three studies in 2019 looking at Denver, Nashville and New York City to really understand where is food waste happening, how much of it is happening and what can we do to ensure that good surplus food is being redistributed instead of wasted. And what we found is that in many cities, in, in those cities, about two thirds of the amount of food waste per capita that was being thrown away was potentially edible. And that food wasn't going to the compost or um, going to another, another use. And so we're really trying to think about what can we do to create the resources that enables people to eat that food and enables it to, and make sure that it doesn't get wasted in other places along that supply chain. Because when it is wasted, all of the water, agricultural land, labor, love, resources, transportation costs, et cetera, are also being wasted. Thank you, Madeline. You, you stated that households contribute to the vast majority of food waste. What are, what are some of the ways or solutions that NRDC has proposed to, to, to remedy this or to encounter? That's a great question. Um, we're trying to work across on several different er areas of focus, um, understanding that the burden shouldn't always be on the consumer, but there are things that we can do to help cons bring consumers along. So for example, Ben gave an excellent example of innovative new products that can raise awareness about this issue while also um, getting consumers 
on board with buying materials that have otherwise gone to waste. But we also have a consumer education campaign called SaveTheFood.com, which provides helpful tips and resources to con for consumers, like how to make banana bread from a banana that's going to waste, or how to store fridge food in your freezer or fridge most effectively so that it's not getting wasted. And that's a great resource. But at the end of the day, we don't have effective, we don't have good and effective measurement to really understand whether those messaging campaigns are effective. And we also need um, so more support to make those make messaging campaigns and consumer education um, and awareness more better funded and better resourced because unless people are getting that messaging consistently and have the res have the um, really can see what's happening, it's not going to be effective in the long run. So that's really what we're trying to um, work on on the residential front. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, I wanted to address, I wanted to inquire with Svanta and, and Dr. Leitamaki about the supply chain. Does minimizing loss in retail restaurant level automatically shift the loss to consumers or suppliers? Could you kindly comment? A bit on that. Yeah, sure. I can start. <clears throat> I would say definitely not. And as yeah, Madeline also mentioned the numbers. I mean, retail retail accounts for roughly thirteen percent. Uh, of course, <clears throat> not as big as as household waste, but still not or still a very significant amount of of, of global food waste. Um, and I would say that this is very much due to inefficiencies uh, in how items are ordered and, and, and how the whole supply chain is run um, in, in the grocery retail. <clears throat> so in, in our experience, um, it's possible with the help of the right tools to cut the food waste in the retail, uh, grocery retail by up to 40% um, that we have done with many of our customers. And the reason is quite simple. Of course, there are, it's always not, you know, just one reason, but, but one quite quite sort of obvious reason is that it's hard to order and replenish a store. There are thousands of products. If you think of your local supermarket or hypermarket, there are thousands of, of products to replenish. Um, if we think about, um, for example, demand forecasting, that there's a lot of different things that affect how much people are going to buy. It's the day of the week. It's the weather. It's is it some event close by. There's a million of different things affecting that. Then you have a lot of things uh, affecting the supply. Are we going to get this from this supplier or that supplier and, and so on? And the amount of products, the sheer assortment of these stores, and also oftentimes a more and more increasing assortment of fresh product products, you know, ready-made meals and other type of ultra fresh products just leads to the simple fact that the equation is, is really hard <laughs> and that leads to waste if it's not if that sort of equation is not solved um, efficiently. Um, and quite often still the case is in uh, many grocery retailers that the ordering is handling uh, is handled uh, locally in the store. So the orders are placed by the store employees um, and oftentimes with a sort of limited limited system support um, in doing so. Um, so that's that's one 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 big source. And there we have seen um, through through implementing technology such as ours uh, by incorporating you know AI to calculate the best possible demand forecast um, to optimize the stock levels to balance the availability versus waste in stores um, and then sort of automate and, automate and centralize that ordering. We typically see the food waste cuts at our implementations range between 10 to 40 percent. Um, a bit depending on, on, on the starting point of, of the retailer. Um, so there's definitely definitely ways, ways to improve. And it's also not just retail in isolation, because <clears throat> the more and more retailers to start to do this in an efficient and the most sort of optimal way, um, this information then will more and more also um, go upwards in the supply chain to, to the suppliers. So the more and more we see collaboration between the retailers and the suppliers means that if the retailers are, are doing their part right and also then sharing their numbers upwards to the, to the suppliers, then the suppliers 
will have more and better information to act upon and are also better positioned than to um, do their production planning or, or, or um, sort of crops <laughs> planning or uh, all of that, that depending on the product sort of what what happens in the in the sort of more early stages in the supply chain so there's a lot lot to do there and it doesn't only affect retail it's, it can start from retail but the effects earlier on in the supply chain are also there Yes, so like Swante said, it's complicated, and uh, and you know if you think about the food service business, there are so many different types of restaurants. You know you have institutional food for schools, for corporations, and then you have small operators. You have Subway, McDonald's. So it really varies across the field in terms of uh, you know the food waste, but uh, but the numbers. Yes, they uh, you know Madeleine mentioned it's 16 percent this responsibility of food services in terms of this waste. And um, and and one estimate says that one third, 1.3% 1 of the US GDP is wasted through the food. So my focus has been on the restaurant operations. So restaurateurs, the business people, uh, they are not going to go into any program unless they see some bottom line benefits. And, and you know, food waste is a great way to attack that because on average, the food cost in a restaurant is from 28 to 35 percent, depending on what type of restaurant you have. And it's estimated that uh, out of that 28 to 35 percent, 4.2 percent is waste. So if you can start minimizing that waste, that percentage goes right into the bottom line. So it improves your profits. And not only to talk about labor costs, which could vary between 30 to 35 percent. But, you know, if you make processes more efficient, you know, the people are not spending time uh, managing the waste or, or, you know, working with the food that will be wasted. So there is a labor benefit, too. So to give you an idea, uh, National Restaurant Association has estimated that one dollar investment into food waste has a six dollar return on investment. So that is a major incentive for many restaurant operators. And uh, they have a program called 86 at the National Restaurant Association where they coordinate that program with Refed. And, and the goal is to reduce uh, food waste in the restaurant sector by 20% by 2025. And, um, and there is a great opportunity. You know, if you think about the food waste in a restaurant, 73% happens back of the house something that the customer will never see. So in that area, all the things that Swante and Madeleine and, and, and others have mentioned, there is a great opportunity to change the processes. And like I said, there is the incentive. Um, so that's a big area. And, and there are many case studies from Dunkin Donuts to Manhattan, which is a restaurant owned by Union Square Hospitality and Danny Meyer, who's a who's an icon in restaurant industry. And, and the, what the industry is trying to do is to see through these case studies uh, if you know, they can then start messaging this and, and pretty much sharing the best practices. On the consumer side, as I mentioned, 27% of the food waste happens front of the house, where, which is exposed to consumers. And according to NRA study, 55% of consumers would like to the, uh, you know, like to go to a restaurant with food waste programs. So that's that's a good sign. So there is, and that is with younger generation that is growing in terms of the numbers because people, younger generations are more concerned about sustainability and food waste being one part of that. But overall, the industry is looking at the procurement. So how can you be more efficient in terms of your supply chain? They're also looking into how to repurpose um, like we heard in terms of um, uh, upcycle. So they're looking at how to repurpose the food and reuse. And um, of course, Neste is one company which operates here in the United States, which is uh, collecting the grease, leftover grease from restaurants and making biofuel out of that. There are tech apps where you, know, you can sign up. Um, companies like Last Call, Food for All, Your Call, where you get notices that this five-star restaurant is having, you know, food, you know, great meals, and, and you can go and get it at the reduced price. 
So, so there are those things. Of course, the big issue is educating and empowering the employees because, you know, they at the end, you know, they process the food and, and if, if there are incentives for them. And finally, the composing, that's, a, that's an area. So the industry is taking this seriously and um, I can go deeper into some of the case studies, but, but it's happening. But just observation, being a Finn in America since 1984, America is resource rich country. You know, I always wondered, I came to Manhattan that I, I couldn't believe people work 24 seven because the lights are on in office buildings 24 seven. Finland, not so resource rich and live, con you know, close connect connection to nature. I think it's more in the culture of the Finnish society to not to waste. So, but I see the younger generation things are happening towards a more of a sort of a Scandinavian sustainable thinking. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Dr. Laitamaki. So uh, obviously we should be attacking food waste on all different fronts from food service, manufacturing and household. But then is there a, a real consensus about where to start first or which sources of food waste we should address? And maybe we could talk a little bit more about the, the challenges and the most effective ways of doing this. Well, I can say from a restaurant point of view, 39% yeah. um, of the waste in restaurants is fruit and vegetable and trimmings. So that's the big area. Then the meat is 19%, bread is 9%. And in this really high inflation, really difficult operating environment, you know, if you, you know, if you put a price tag on a bread, um, like two dollars because you know you have traditions you know people come and some expect the bread some don't but if you put a price tag you can get additional revenue and you reduce the waste because what happens to the waste or to the bread basket even if you don't touch it goes to waste so there are these small things but like I said it's the fruit vegetables where it, where it starts that's the biggest biggest item that followed by meat and bread for restaurants Yeah, jump in. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna. Uh, I thought I could just sort of answer from the retail point of view. I, I guess it's pretty much the same things as you guys saying here about about the cost and and the sort of um, margins. I mean, food waste for retail is not something that, or it's it's the perfect storm of being both sort of envir environmentally good and sustainable, but also good for the business. So it's not something that has just recently emerged. I mean, margins are tight. <laughs> In, in grocery retail um, and um, food waste just equals throwing away money in the bin. So of course, food waste has al always been of very special interest to, to the grocery retail because, well, you know, the, the profit mar margins are, are thin and, and reducing, let's say, halving the, the, the food waste, <clears throat> halving the spoilage for, for a grocery retail actually will lead to very significant profit increases bottom line so so same thing there um so I, I i don't think it's i don't think retail needs that much convincing about that this is a problem because it's it's a recognized problem that sort of has both both environmental and 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 monetary monetary benefits but also also echoing a bit Yuka's thoughts i would also like to see more of course money i mean most often times it's the money that counts. So, so a grocery retailer will focus on reducing spoilage there where it costs the most. And oftentimes this also then um, goes hand in hand with products that, that cost the most money are also oftentimes the ones that are most environmentally <laughs> sort of uh, consuming as well, let's say beef, for example. But it would be, uh, I, I think, just an angle also for retailers to more and more focus and make sure to absolutely minimize waste in sort of environmentally heavy, heavy product categories such as beef and you know meats and, and coffee and chocolates, um, dairy, to, to actually like really minimize, put the efforts uh, to minimize spoilage in, in these categories. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I think. NRDC sees that everyone has a role to play in reducing food waste across the food supply chain. And um, you can mention changing the processes and, and we really need to also like rethink the system. That, that's such a good way of thinking about it. Cause oftentimes the issue 
um, is very landfill centric. And so how can we make sure that food is think we're thinking about it as food and not waste in the first place. So that's why NRDC really focuses in on cities, states, and the federal government to shift policy and ultimately shift the conversation away from a paradigm of waste and more towards rethinking the problem of food waste in the first place so that we have a food system that is not promoting waste. Um, so one example of how we're doing this is through NRDC's Food Matters Initiative, which works with cities to um, work across sectors on different solutions and strategies that city staff and local organizations and regional entities and state entities can take to reduce food waste. So, um, and, and then scale that up by knowledge sharing with other cities so that cities can learn from each other and then inform state and federal policy, which ultimately is going to get benefits back into those cities and those communities. And so some of the examples are working with cities to create residential campaigns specific to their communities that focused on the issues that their cities want to hear about. So for example, in the city of Philadelphia, they did some focus groups in different diverse neighborhoods to understand how do you, how do your, how did these, this neighborhood's residents um, interpret food waste and what does it mean in their community? And sometimes it's not just about, oh, I don't know how to store my food correctly. It might be that a neighborhood doesn't have a grocery store. And so somebody's only able to go to the grocery store every three weeks and have to, has to really pile in a big load of food. Or they're getting a USDA food box from food for food assistance and they don't actually ha have the resources or the um, information for how to cook that food. And so it's really wasted before it comes into the household. So how can we craft education that makes it so that people um, aren't bearing the brunt of that when it comes when that food comes into their homes. We also work with restaurants on restaurant food waste reduction challenges and um, interventions with health inspectors so that they can provide things like safe food donation guidance to restaurants. So it kind of runs the gamut, really trying to create um, a place where cities can take the lead on promoting food waste reduction across the um, supply chain. Thanks, Maybe Bella. That was actually, can... Yes, please. Please, yeah, yeah uh, I can share some uh, ideas and, and progress uh, from the Finnish context. So the, the highest sale of food waste uh, in, uh, in, Finnish, in Finland is coming from the households. And of course, that's a general, general um, uh, thing. Uh, so it's 45% in Finland. So uh, in, you can also see, see it in the figures per capita. So it's 53 kilograms per capita per year. And the second largest share is coming from the manufacturing industry, 25% uh, it, so it's uh, 29 kilograms per capita per year. And uh, uh, so the amounts are there, but when we are thinking about the efficiency, where should we um, uh, do the, the, or where should we uh, find the, the means and, and the incentives? Uh, we can see in Finland, uh, when we have uh, collecting the data from the edible uh, part of the food waste, that in retail and food service sectors, there has been uh, uh, development. Uh, so the amounts have de decreased during the, the uh, 10 years, um, uh, uh, based on the 10 years data. And, and we already heard that that in retail sector, the improving management systems and um, electronic forecasting and ordering systems, they are the means and, and there's incentives to, to um, use those. And that the same goes to the food service sector also. So they have uh, managed to uh, predict the customer uh, quantities better and, and menu, menu design has improved and, and that kind of uh, things have um, uh, are behind the, the decreased amounts. But then the um, sectors uh, like households and industry uh, where the highest amounts are coming from, um, they are maybe uh, more diverse, especially the household sector. Uh, and um, so the the means for them 
uh, are harder to, to find. Of course, for the industry, the economic incentives are, are more obvious than the households and, and uh, mm, the different lifestyles of the uh, consumers. Uh, one which is behind that uh, the the general means and information is not working with everybody. So that's that's uh, the sector where we still have a lot to do, as also Madeline uh, pointed out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. So Madeline, you already touched a bit on this from the US side about how could different contributors responsibility be approached. Um, but but Inkeri, did you want to touch maybe on that from the Finnish side regarding uh, maybe uh, authority regulation, whether it's government or business or consumers? How could different contributors' responsibility be approached? Yes, um, um, as I already told, uh, first uh, we have now that at the European level there has been set this uh, uh, delegated act, which me which means that. Every European country um, uh, has to follow and report the, the amount of food waste, and we have committed to this uh, 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 goal to halve food waste by uh, 2030. So uh, that means that that we uh, we have. I think every European country has to to um, make some kind of um, uh, food waste uh, reduction roadmap. And uh, uh, we have um, this kind of, so we need uh, efficient re regulation and, and policy instruments. And, and we have already now in Finland, it's kind of uh, a new le legislation, waste legislation, uh, which where we have the first time also this uh, food waste. <clears throat> and and uh, so actually um, the, uh, the actors from, uh, uh, Food service uh, industry and uh, retail sector has to start also to follow based on this legislation the amount of food waste. But then I think uh, uh, we need uh, also, as Madeline said, this education and uh, and also in, in our uh, roadmap we have set the one goal that we have to increase this education uh, and uh, and we need this kind of social cultural changes and and. Uh, and that's, uh, but as Mia said, it's very challenging to change people's behavior, and, and that's something what we are now uh, uh, trying to figure out that what we can do, and, and uh, uh, that's uh, one goal that we could have different kind of uh, uh, tools uh, for different kind of. Uh, 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 consumers. So there, there are consumers, for example, who are um, interested in food waste questions and er environmental questions. And then uh, we can have, for example, campaigns. But then uh, there are a group of people who are not interesting at all. So we have to, uh, for example, develop uh, this kind of nudging, nudging uh, uh, practices to to uh, reduce uh, the food waste of of that group. Uh, yes, and, and then we, we need uh, uh, new technological innovations and business models, as we have heard today about these upcycled uh, products. That's a good example. Uh, Bart, can I comment on, on Inkeri's point about uh, consumer behavior? Just recently, I've done research uh, about, um, you know, corporate food service with Google, and Google is known for you know, taking care of their employees. And uh, there has been an evolution in terms of uh, the kind of food they serve, kind of snacks they serve. And uh, it's an interesting thing. For example, um, you know, they have the lunch buffet. So by designing the buffet so that you put the healthy items, salads, uh, fruits, all those things to the beginning, and then meat is at the end, so consumer may not have, so the uh, Googler may not have that much space on a plate. It's a very simple solution for that big steak. And then, you know, you look, look, look at the footprint of, of different items and the spoilage. Um, and they've been able to reduce their food cost uh, by 7% based on that. The other one is, uh, and this goes together with healthy food. So it's not only focusing on 
on waste, but it's also focusing on people eating better. For instance, on the drinks, you know, when you go to the cooler, the upper shelf at your eye level, like in retailing, which is important when you go to the grocery store, what products at the eye level, they have the healthy water-based drinks. If you want your Coca-Cola, you have to bend down and behind this uh, frosted glass where you can't even see a Red Bull and Coke, you have to bend down and get it from there. So things like this, you know, so they're, they're very, very innovative in terms of working with the behavioral changes. Yeah, I want just, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just uh, want to highlight that that um, we think that the challenge is um, in households. So it's it's challenging to change uh, people's behavior in their households. It's much more easier in uh, retail stores or in restaurants, but in households, it's 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 very challenging because we. Um, yeah, we, we don't we can't change the environment or <laughs> make some uh, changes there. Yeah, I agree. I will just sorry, can I just I'm not a moderator, but I just want to ask on that. Do we see any indication on the inflation now? I mean, forcing people to cut their food waste, whether they want or not. Like, are, are we seeing any indication of this already now or is it too early to tell or we don't have the data yet? If somebody has has information on that, it would be interesting to know. Do you mean that have we some kind of regulation? Uh, I'm just meaning that you know, as you said that it's hard to affect households. Yes, it is. But I'm thinking like with the with the sort of huge well, at, inflation we have at the moment, yeah. people are, are probably less prone to throw away. <laughs> yeah, at least here in Finland, we don't have any regulation it's focusing on 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 industry retail and and, and uh, food services but uh, on household uh, concerning uh, food waste we don't have have any so it's it's of course possible to we have a, a different kind of um, uh, waste boxes like uh, bio waste and etc but that that's not uh, uh, not reducing the amount of food waste yeah, yeah. That, is a, that is a great yeah. observation so with the increase of cost of goods are consumers shopping more responsibly and more sparingly in terms and are we seeing that reflected in the amount of food waste yet i'm sure it's a little early to to see those effects but that is an interesting observation uh dr Laitamaki, sorry yeah yes you know from a restaurant industry it's at this point it's anecdotal but but um many restaurants have re-engineered or menu engineered the menus to have ingredients which are not that expensive um, offering smaller portion sizes because there is the limit how high you can go with the price because it's the option the consumer especially in America they they go out and eat more than in Finland but there comes a limit with your disposable income and then you start thinking okay if I go to a restaurant what, what I'm going to order and and you know those uh, low price item be, items become more popular and um, so there there could be an opportunity here to also address the food waste in terms of being more economical, having a more economical menu. Yeah, and I'll just add too that um, consumer food waste is really, really hard to measure and there's not standardized measure measurement to help provide data to better target solutions. There's also, it's also hard to measure behavior change. So when food waste is happening in the household, you can't measure, a lot of times with like energy efficiency, you have a smart meter and so you can compare yourself to your neighbors. Food waste is much different than that because it's coming from all different places. It's going to all different places. And it's also very private and very emotional for people. And so it can be hard to really, really find effective ways to measure that. And so um, it's, it's we, we got these questions a lot when the pandemic first started about like everyone's at home like are you seeing more or less food waste and i think it's similar now with um inflation and the high cost of food is are you seeing more or less food waste and i think across the board we don't know for sure but it's interesting that today in 2022 consumers pay way less proportionately of their annual income than they did many decades ago and so the cost of food is so significant but it's hard to see the cost of food and then see how much um 
tonnage is actually still going to the landfill without substantial investments in measurement. And so that's something that we're really hoping to see from the federal government here in the US is more investment in measurement and standardized reporting. Yes, that'd be great. I, I saw also on the, the, the NRDC's website just about the focus on cities because uh, just the impact could come a lot more swiftly and greatly from cities where they control so much more of the regulations versus you have 50 different states with 50 different regulations and one government over it. So uh, I thought that was an interesting observation. Uh, I want to move on to our last panelist question here before we have a couple great questions from our audience today. So uh, lastly, I want to ask, can we reach the UN Sustainable Development Goal of reducing waste by 50% per capita by 2030, and how? I'm happy oh. to start us off oh, here. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of work to do, but if there are substantial investments, especially from at the policy level, we can see the impacts across the food supply chain. Um, I'll just note that I saw an article or a post on LinkedIn yesterday that um, IKEA actually reached their 50% reduction in food waste goal um, eight years early. And so there are entities that are doing it, but I think in the US especially, we need a lot more prioritization of food waste reduction policy. Um, some of the areas that we need to see action is investing in food waste prevention and keeping organic waste out of the landfill and incinerators. And this is also an equity issue because about 80% of landfills and incinerators are actually located in Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, which are disproportionately getting impacted from that pollution and also have higher rates of food insecurity. Um, we also need to enable more donation of surplus food to make it easier to ensure that surplus food is getting redistributed. Um, we need to educate and activate households, which are the largest collective source of U.S. food waste. And then we need to pass policies like, policies like standardizing food packaging date labels, which cause a lot of confusion. Um, NRDC, along with several other partners, recently re released a report, and there's more than 20 opportunities in the 2023 U.S. Farm Bill that include actions to prevent food from going to waste and re rescuing surplus food, recycling food scraps. Um, and really helping to draw down those emissions. And so we're really excited to see um, what's going to happen in the next few years with federal policy, state policy, and the municipal, municipal level policies, Bart, that you just mentioned that can really impact um, what's happening in cities. You know, from restaurant industry point of view, as I mentioned, National Restaurant Association has the goal of reduction of food waste by 20% by 2025. So I think it's feasible, you know, to go to the 50%. And um, as I mentioned, it's 4.2% of, um, of the food cost is waste. So cutting that into half, I think it's feasible, but it's really going back to the procurement. So, you know, how, how the procurement is done so that there will, will be as little as possible waste in that process, because the back of the house is 73%. So the opportunity is definitely there. It can be done from the restaurant side. Yeah, and I agree on the retail side. Many, <clears throat> many big grocers, especially at least in Europe, where I mainly operate, have already adopted these targets themselves, um, aiming to have their, their, their food waste uh, by 2030. So it's already, already happening. And, and um, yeah, uh, as mentioned, there are there are tools tools to do it. So Minister Skinner was calling for let's do stuff, and I'm call, my call to action is is that if somebody is there listening, <laughs> with suboptimal retail processes, let's stay in touch and let's let's do something about it because that's that's totally possible. Thank you, Inkeri and Mia. Any any insights from your side? Um, just one one uh, thing to add is that uh, it's uh, it's a little bit pity that the reference year for this uh, re uh, this uh, de development goal is 2020 uh, because it makes it a little bit harder. For example, from the Finnish perspective, since quite much has already been done, uh, so so it's it makes uh, it more challenging to do even more, uh, but. 
as we have heard, there's a lot of means and and uh, but uh, but we still need to work to do, especially in the household sector. Great, great. Um, if there were no further additional comments on that question, I'd like then to move to audience questions. So. We have a question from Ulrika. It sounds so the question is, it sounds that the US households cause much more food waste than in other countries. Is there some clear reasons why the consumer behavior in the US is different compared to other countries? Um, that's a great question. I think that there's, again, it kind of goes back to that policy level and access to um, infrastructure. So I think what's happening in a lot of US cities is a lot of US households don't actually have access to composting. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we really need to see more investment in composting infrastructure so that if households are wasting food, it's going to a compost or a another food scrap recycling um, process like AD instead of to the landfill because a lot of that a lot of that infrastructure and policy just isn't there in a lot of US cities. So that's part of what we work on at NRDC, both at the federal, state, and local level to get. Um, I think also what we're seeing in the US is really confusing date labels. And so I didn't really touch on this, but um, date labels are not federally mandated. And then there's a bunch of like piecemeal um, requirements at the state level. So they're very confusing. It can say best buy, used by, best if used by, et cetera. And there's not any federal mandate for food safety except for infant formula. And so one of our goals is to help standardize those date labels and make them more consistent so that consumers aren't throwing away perfectly good food because so often consumers will get a carton of milk see a best if used by which has nothing to do with food safety on it and then pour the milk out without even tasting or smelling it which is really going to be the key indicators for that so that's an area where we see a lot of confusion um, and then across the board i think just um, kind of disrupting a culture of consumption like i said food is cheap even with inflation and so how can we ensure that consumers are being mindful about their purchases and being mindful about um, the food that's in their fridge and and what what can we do as advocates in this space to ensure that um, consumers have the resources that they need and again it comes back to um, policy level investments and policy level mandates for um, the systems that are creating too much food going into consumers' households in the first place, and then not enough infrastructure for where that food can go um, after it leaves the home. So that's kind of the areas that we are focusing on and where there might be more waste. You know, I, I second second everything what Madeline said, but the interesting statistics would be the average size of, of a fridge in Finland versus United States. And, and you know, it's a trip to Costco, the family goes in and, you know, Costco is a great retailing concept. Either you buy for one person or the whole family. And then they basically move the storage business from their warehouse to the family. So American family has a big fridge. They also have a pantry and they load up like the world is going to end tomorrow. So you have to have those reserves. But it's also the mentality. And and which is in Finland, you know, we don't have a storage space and and that that impacts you know, the food waste that you have a big storage and, and you don't consume all that. So I think there there is that behavioral thing, but, you know, that's very deep in culture. You know, the the Americans, the kitchen is very important. The size of the fridge is important. So, so I don't know how that's to a, change that. That's an excellent point. And if I can just add to that really quickly, um, my colleague Andrew Collins wrote a report called Feeding a City, and it looks at where food waste is coming from different cities and kind of the interventions for um, addressing that food waste. And one of the 
um, correlations between food waste that was found was urban density. And so there's this also this piece of like sprawl and how cities are built that, again, if you're going to the grocery store in a car and it's far away, you're probably buying more food than if you have a corner store down stairs from you. And so that could also be a contributor to um, just how our built environment influences food waste. I, I absolutely yes. Like in, in in Europe, I was I was living in Budapest, Hungary, and there'd be a corner store right around the, the the corner, and people would do their grocery shopping daily and pick up their bread daily instead of driving to Costco and stocking up for the entire week, and that causes uh, excess and spoilage. Um, then I just want to move on to the next question here from Kristen. When I lived in Finland, the trash cans inside the household are significantly smaller than the ones used in the US. It shows clearly Finns are accustomed to generating less waste and sort recyclable waste more efficiently, in part due to more accessible recycling stations. Any comment on that? That was also interesting, Madeline, what you're, you were stating about the lack of composting uh, programs or accessibility here in the US too. So do we have any commentary on uh, regarding uh, just that question there? I mean, just to say that um, it's in the Finnish culture. I mean, I remember I have seen this change that I have made so many mistakes when I dump stuff into the wrong bin in Finland because I'm not used to here because I don't have an option. Like Madeline said, there's no infrastructure to recycle, reuse, and, and these type of things. So, so I think, but, but the interesting thing is that the culture in Finland is really preserving resources. So you visit a Finnish family, and it is very important that you know how to behave in terms of food waste and all these things. So that's an observation. Yeah, and I think adding on to that, um, I think in the US, part of what we need to, and I mentioned this earlier, rethinking the system, part of what we need to do is debunking the myth of a way. Um, I think it's very, um, it's, it's very built into our culture that you can throw something away. And that's not a reality, that's a construct. And so um, I, whenever I go into friends' houses and I see their bins, I'm like, switch it up, make your recycling bin be the big one and your trash bin be the small one. And um, it's going to change the way you think about your what you're purchasing, where it's going, et cetera. And so I think that that's part of what we are trying to do is shift away from like waste management and more towards ensuring that food is eaten. Yeah, one comment here just on that topic from Sweden. So we <clears throat> we live in I live in Sweden here in a house, and just thinking about incentives for this particular topic. Here we actually have it the way that when when the trash is picked up, it's weighed. So both the food wa food waste, the compost, and the sort of normal waste, they are weighed separately, and we pay per kilogram of waste we generate. Whereas recycling is free when you take it to the sort of recycling place. So that's just a small incitement to <laughs> really recycle because the trash you don't recycle, you pay for. So that's an interesting thing here. That is. Um, next question is from Emma. What are your thoughts regarding localized production versus minimizing waste? I would assume that more shattered production would be less optimized than larger plants. Well, I, I, I think it's the, you know, this uh, mass production of food. America has invented it and uh, some of that food is not healthy at all. So it's back to the economics of uh, economies of scale. And um, and but there is that movement of slow food, local food. Restaurants are picking that up, healthy food. But I think um, the. American food manufacturing agricultural industry it's very powerful it's very difficult to change and and you know Madeline mentioned this that in many neighborhoods the only access you have is bad food which is processed food and and you don't have healthy options 
especially in a low income communities. So, so it, it is a great way to do that. And, and, you know, the footprint would be less in terms of sustainability, but, but I think it's a mighty institution in this country. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Latamaki. Uh, we have five minutes left and we have three questions. So I would like to go through these three here. So we have a next question from Shreya. So this question is for Ben. At Upcycle Food Association, are you looking into a degrowth implementation strategy? Of course, utilizing food that would be otherwise just wasted is good to be used for alternatives but it does not combat the root cause of climate crises over consumption. So my question is, what is the scope for entrepreneurship to lead to regrowth? Ben? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, we are well aware that it's important to align incentives to get at the root uh, at, at our mission, which is to prevent food waste by growing the upcycle food economy. So there's a focus on using the resources we are already producing. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, Mad Madeline talked about 40% of <clears throat> the food waste being in the home. That means 60% of the food waste is before restaurants and the grocery store, it's in the supply chain. And what we, um, what our goal is to do is to use that 60% of the supply chain that already exists um, and not incentivize companies to create more waste so that they can claim uh, that they're using upcycled ingredients. So I could go into um, more details on how we do that, but it is a central piece that um, there's, there's plenty of food that's already going to waste and companies uh, should be incentivized to use what is already going to waste and not make more waste so that they can claim, uh, you know, further sustainability benefits. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Next question was for Svante um, from Christian. You mentioned that demand is affected by events, weather, and other factors. What factors can you take in consideration in your software solution, and what is the probability for them to come true? Thanks. Yeah, good question. So yeah, there are, uh, as said, tens of different or even hundreds, hundreds potential of factors that do affect affect demand. Um, I'm not maybe going to list all of them here, but I said the major ones being being uh, well day of the week. Then we mentioned the other factors, uh, weather, um, weather events. Then of course, I mean promotions are one of the biggest biggest sales drivers where there is a promotion, um, the price point um, of, of of the product, and so on. So a lot of different factors. Um, then for the pro probability question, well, I guess that's not easy to answer on a, on a generic level. Um, of course, I mean different factors play in all of these factors are all the time in an interplay with each other. You have a price, you have a weekday, you have maybe an ongoing promotion, you have maybe the Super Bowl next to you, like all of this happens at, white, at once, constantly ever changing. So, so what just, just an advanced model does is all the time to, to weigh, weigh all of the data that it gets, get, gets um, fed with and, and, and tries to make the most accurate estimate. They use the use the data in, in the most optimal way all the time to sort of um, um, put a more weight on the data that actually ex seems to explain the demand and also then cutting away the, the noise, cutting away the data that is there but doesn't really, really affect demand. <clears throat> so yeah, a, a short answer to a complex question. Thank you. Thank you, Svante. So we are just about to run out of time, but I just want to thank our fantastic panelists of experts and organizers of this event, and also our audience for being present today at Food for Thought. Should you have any further follow-up questions or would like to contact us, please do reach out. 
And once again, we very much thank you for joining us today.